Disasters come in many forms throughout the world. Hurricanes, cyclones, earthquakes, wildfires, tsunamis, poverty, civil unrest, the failures of governments, and the list goes on and on. The constant in every case is the almost bottomless need for essential medical supplies and equipment to enable victims to regain their health and to achieve a better quality of life. Meeting that need in a non-sectarian, non-governmental, non-discriminatory manner at home and abroad is the mission of Direct Relief. To better understand Direct Relief, we took a focused look at its founders. Who were they? Why did they start the organization? Our research in this regard uncovered some interesting historical intersections. Let us start with the titular founder, William Zimden. What do we know about him? Well, he was an Estonian by birth, who as a young man joined the Russian Imperial Army and fought in the Far East. He is said to be the closest thing Europe had to our own Howard Hughes. Like Hughes, he owned movie companies, one in Europe and the other Sunbeam Film Productions had offices at Hollywood and Vine. During his early European years, he had become a wealthy, mysterious person, having made his initial fortune mining gold in Siberia. Smuggled out of Siberia during the 1917 Communist Revolution by the U.S. Ambassador to Russia, he re-entered Europe through Sweden in 1921, a period of massive inflation after World War I. With his extensive gold holdings, he was able to invest widely. This included chemical plants in Germany, banks in the Balkan states, hotels and resorts in Yugoslavia and Austria, farms as well as casinos located throughout Europe. One particular property is worth noting. Zimden's purchase of the Blücher Palace on Pariserplatz in Berlin was noted in the New York Times in 1922. The article commented on the fact that a German newspaper was complaining about the purchase of a venerable local landmark to a Lettish American for dollars. Zimden's new residence was so large that he later sold it to the United States for its Berlin embassy. There's an old saying in buying real estate, location, location, location. That is the famous Blücher Palace on the far right under the orange circle. It is described in a 1916 New York Times article as a palace which distinguished itself on every patriotic occasion when all Berlin was gaily decorated with flags by its ostentatious somberness. One interesting historical fact is that the mansion Zimden purchased was immediately adjacent to the 1797 residence of John Quincy Adams, the building under the Lavender Triangle. Adams was the United States' first ambassador to a German-speaking country. And in the middle of the picture, under the green diamond, you will probably recognize one of the most famous landmarks in all of Europe, the Brandenburg Gates. The Brandenburg Gates later became the infamous symbol of Nazi power. In fact, Pariser Platz is loaded with history. It was used as a showcase for Nazi rallies and marches. After World War II, what little was left of the Zimden mansion after the Berlin bombings was on the actual demarcation line between East and West Berlin and as a consequence was incorporated into the 1961 Berlin Wall, a structure which became the international symbol of communism's Iron Curtain. Pariser Platz was the place where John F. Kennedy gave his famous Ich bin ein Berliner speech and Ronald Reagan later called on Khrushchev to tear down this wall. The U.S. finally built its new embassy on the site, which, de which was dedicated on July 4, 2008. It appears to lack some of the old world charm of its predecessor. In 1926, Adolf Hitler called a meeting in Munich to seek the support of 600 of the largest Austrian and German industrialists including William Zimden. Zimden walked out in the middle of that meeting, making himself a marked man, and in 1938, with Hitler on the march, he was finally forced to flee Vienna, going first to Monte Carlo and ending up in the U.S. in 1940. His experiences in fleeing, first communism and later totalitarianism, and his empathy for those he left behind were central to Zimden's 
subsequent involvement in our story concerning direct relief. In 1948, he formed the William Zimden Foundation, the predecessor of Direct Relief International. He died just three years later, leaving one half of his estate to the foundation. One would have hoped that his bequest would have amounted to tens of millions of dollars, but the communists, the U.S. decision to go off the gold standard, the Nazi occupation of Europe and its attendant confiscation of his properties, litigation and taxes meant that seven years after his death, the foundation received just $925,000. The executor of the Zimden estate was Dennis Karzag, Zimden's administrative assistant. Karzag was really the person who took control of the foundation and he turned it into the international disaster relief organization it is today. Dennis Karzag was a Hungarian by birth who later moved to Vienna and assumed Austrian citizenship. In the aftermath of World War I, his family in Austria suffered severe hardships eating bread made of sawdust and living through cold winters with inadequate clothing. During that period, his school was visited by the newly created American Friends Service Committee, the Quakers, which handed out cans of corned beef and a spoon to the boys at his school. It was an act of kindness he never forgot. He later said he always associated the smell of corned beef with life itself. Dennis also made and lost fortunes in Europe. He went into the label design and weaving business, selling to high-end stores like Bullock's in the United States. His most famous label was the one his company designed and loomed for Janssen swimsuits, using the iconic Janssen Diving Girl, which is still in use to this very day. The 1929 crash, however, decimated his fortune. In 1934, he started a seed business which grew to immense proportions, but Hitler's ambitions intervened, and being Jewish on his mother's side, he was forced to abandon the business and leave Europe for America. Karzag was in the process of starting a European ice cream business in California when he received a telegram from William Zimden, asking him to go to work for him as his executive assistant building Villa Capistel in Ez, which is located on the Mediterranean coast just outside Monte Carlo. Both men knew of each other only by reputation. Karzag nonetheless agreed and returned to France to assist Zimden in the completion of the villa, which is now a very expensive French hotel with suites that run as high as 7,000 euros per night. That's about 9,000 American dollars. When the Nazis invaded Poland, Karzang impulsively sought to enlist in the French army, which took one look at his Austrian passport and imprisoned him as an enemy alien. He was held in a typhus-infested prison for five months. While there, he once again received unexpected aid from the American Friends Service Committee, this time in the form of food and much-needed sanitation materials. This American assistance, in time of need, made a strong impression on Dennis Karzag. When he gained his release through the U.S. State Department, he sailed for America for the second time. Dennis Karzag had experienced degradation and separation from family and friends. He had also acquired firsthand knowledge of the suffering, pain, and death of others during periods of civil unrest. His subsequent leadership in the creation and operation of an international relief organization was a direct result of his experiences. When Zimden and Karzag came to Santa Barbara, Zimden again started purchasing real estate as he had done in Europe. He bought various properties and ranches in the area. In 1944, he purchased the Arcady estate from the founder of Union Carbide and moved into a smaller house that came with it a house he called El Descanso, which means the resting place. The pantry in El Descanso is the true birthplace of direct relief, where the very first shipment of canned goods, purchased from the Piggly Wiggly Market on Milchmas Street, and medical supplies purchased from the Red Cross Pharmacy on State Street, were assembled for shipment. We wouldn't be surprised if some of those canned goods included corned beef. To complete this historic circle, Zimden also acquired the entire Montecito Country Club, the dining room of which 
was the location of the Direct Relief 60th anniversary dinner over six decades later. Dennis Karzag met his future wife, Sylvia Lopez Negretti, in Santa Barbara. The daughter of a physician, she worked with her husband after Zimden's death to carry out the growing mission of direct relief. In the 1990s, her tenacity resulted in the res rescue of the organization, which was in the process of being downsized and effectively mothballed by a small family control board. That rescue resulted in a new era of local community control of the organization, beginning in 1991. Sylvia served as an interim president, and a new direct relief emerged from a financial trough that very nearly closed its doors. We owe a lot to Sylvia's dedication. She has been a part of the organization since its inception, and she still lives in Santa Barbara. Over the 60 years since 1948, there have been many concerned and caring citizens of the Santa Barbara community who have stepped forward and done some wonderful things to finally put Direct Relief on a firm financial footing. We at Direct Relief sincerely appreciate their many donations of both time and money. This graph depicts the historic annual deliveries of humanitarian resources from 1948 to the year 2008 to well over 60 countries in the world. It will give you a feeling for Direct Relief International's current trajectory. The Board of Direct Relief looks forward to continuing and building on the successes of the last 60 years and creating a better world. With the continuing financial support of the citizens of Santa Barbara and increasingly the rest of this great country, we feel sure we can do just that.